Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variations using large samples of language data. So on behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. And as you can see, I'm coming to you from a new setting, the Corpus Cast Studio, if you will, um, where occasionally in the series, I'll be lucky enough to meet guests face to face. Uh, so this is our first episode from the studio. So do bear with us uh, as we get used to working in this different uh, format. In each episode of Corpus Cast, I interview top researchers in the field about uh, to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas. In this episode, our topic is literary linguistics. Now, fiction is a big part of many of our lives, and many people enjoy nothing more than sitting down with a good book and getting lost in a fictional world. But for many, growing up and attending school, the study of literature is often considered to be completely separate to the study of language. Well, not for my guest today and many other researchers in the field of literary linguistics which is all about the application of linguistic theories and methods, including corpus linguistics, to literary texts. So to tell me more about this, I'm thrilled to be joined by Professor Michaela Malberg, Professor of Corpus Linguistics and Director of the Center for Corpus Research at the University of Birmingham. Michaela's research focuses on the interface of language and literature. She's specifically interested in speech and body language in Victorian fiction, especially Dickens, textual cohesion, discourse analysis, and literary translation. Beyond the study of fiction, Michaela is a well-known face in corpus linguistics. She's the editor of one of the biggest journals in the field, the International Journal of Corpus Linguistics, and she is a co-editor of the Corpus and Discourse book series with Gavin Brooks. Michaela is a prolific and widely published researcher, is in the author of books, including Corpus Stylistics and Dickens Fiction, and co-editor of Corpus Linguistics, Context and Culture with Viola Wiegand. She's also a fellow podcaster, and she's a host of uh, Life and Language, a podcast about life and why language matters, which um, I'm sure we'll hear more about later on. But without any further ado, let's please welcome to Corpus Cast, Michaela Malberg. Hello, Michaela. Hi. It's great to see you. Hi. And thank you very much for... <laughs> For coming uh, and doing this face to face, this is the first time we've done this, so I um, really appreciate you popping down the road from the University of Birmingham and joining us in the. Uh, I'm calling it the Corpus Cast Studios. It's not really. I, I, That's <laughs> a nice place. We'll call it that. Yeah. <laughs> thank um, you for having me, Robbie. That's uh, really, really thank you for coming on. It's it's great to have you. Let's jump into it then. The question that I ask everybody at the beginning of these conversations: What does corpus linguistics mean to you? Yeah, that, that's quite a big question for <laughs> yes, the beginning, it is. you know, yeah, that's something yeah. we could end up yeah. with at the end. But yeah, it's really, yeah. Corpus linguistics, to me, is really a good way of studying how we use language to make sense of the world. You know, it's mm. very tempting to say when you start explaining corpus linguistics, it's very tempting to start with methods and saying, oh, there are these computers that mm. we can use and it's all fabulous. I think... To me, it's really important to start with the understanding of language that we have so that corpus linguistics then makes sense. Mm. So it's kind of, to me, the most important thing is that language is a social phenomenon. So language is one of the most important building blocks for society. And what that means is basically that we use language all the time, every day. Whatever we do has to do with language. And human beings very much like habits. You know, mm -hmm. they're the same ways of doing stuff. And that is applicable to language as well. I mean, there are these textbook examples where you look at go to a restaurant, order a meal, and then you teach students how to use certain phrases. But it's really everywhere. So if you think about going to work in the morning, if you think about what happens in our house, it's always the same stuff like, have you got your mobile? Have you got your PE kit? What time will you be home today? And th this is all phrasal stuff. So mm. we don't work that out every time we get up and think about going to school and think about mm. going to work. And I think this is where corpus linguistics then comes in. Because if you produce a lot of language, you get a lot of evidence. Once you've got that evidence, 
you can study this. And this is where for me now the methods and the computers come in. So it's really looking at these habits, looking at frequencies, looking at how repeated behavior translates into social norms, ways of thinking. So that's the kind of corpus linguistic I'm interested in. So tell me, you know, this is not necessarily something that you wake up one morning, you know, I want to be a corpus linguist, no. I want to study language and, and mm. the patterns and the repeated ways that we that we do things day to day. Yeah. Tell me about your, your academic journey. How did you end up in this mm. in this line of work doing this sort of research mm, yeah sounds good this line of work isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah because um, uh, i started off with um, a first degree in english and mathematics that i did at the university of bonn and i always liked english and mathematics mm -hmm. and luckily in germany you could do these things together at the time which i thought was really really good because then you can kind of uh, not make that decision mm. of is it more this or that and mm. then before I finished we did this module corpus linguistics and I thought, oh this is really good because it's kind of you can use some mathematics that is fine you can stick with the English that is fabulous and that is kind of how I then went into corpus linguistics because I thought yeah you can actually do both if you want sometimes a bit more of the other but um, and then I ended up uh, for my PhD spending some time at the University of Birmingham and um, yeah I think f from there uh, the rest is history kind of. <laughs> yeah. And mentioning Birmingham of course yeah. uh, that's where you you work now chair in mm. corpus linguistics you lead mm. the corpus linguistics uh, research center there. Um, Birmingham has a, an incredibly rich history in, mm. in corpus linguistics and um, you're my first guest from Birmingham, so I'm very keen to, okay. to hear more about so your perspective of, of the history of corpus linguistics at Birmingham and how that feeds into the sort of work that you and your colleagues are, are doing now. Mm. Obviously, I mean, history is, again, everyone's version of history, yeah. <laughs> but kind of, I think for a lot of people, um, the history of corpus linguistics at Birmingham will also be kind of a history of the corpus revolution in lexicography. Mm. So when the first Cobalt Dictionary was published in the 1980s, that, that was quite a big thing, you know, because before that, the way people wrote dictionaries was kind of thinking about what should go in, reading a lot of literature, thinking, oh, Jane Austen said this wonderfully, so that's a good example, or, you know, copying what other people had done in dictionaries. But with the Cobalt Dictionary, it was really a new way of making use of all this evidence we now had. So going back to language as social phenomenon, looking at how people actually use the language. So it was about putting frequent words into the dictionary, putting frequent senses of frequent words into mm -hmm. the dictionaries. And I think that is really what you would associate with the beginnings of corpus linguistics. And then, you know, in terms of blue plaques that people <laughs> want to think about, then we had obviously John Sinclair mm -hmm. who let this COBOL team. And it wasn't him alone, obviously, that it was a big team of people. And you now have people from that team here. So with Ramesh Krishnamurti, for instance, and then people went to other universities. So there's Patrick Hanks, Michael Howey spent some time there. So this is all kind of um, part of it. And then, yeah, corpus linguistics also changes with the people who do it, because mm. everyone brings their individual interests to it. So when then Wolfgang Teubert came to the University of Birmingham, he had quite different interests and especially this idea of, you know, the discourse and how you get meaning from the discourse. So that uh, changed things quite a lot. Um, and then we also still have people who were there from the beginning. So Susan Hansen, yeah. you know, her pattern grammar and now the pattern grammar project is still going strong and looking at what you can do with so so for people who listen to this and are, are may not uh, may not be so into corpus linguistics pattern grammar is this idea of looking at the words and patterns in which these words appear so if you say something like afraid you can say afraid of or you can mm. say afraid that or you can say i'm afraid which is a completely different thing from afraid of and pattern grammar puts these patterns together, provides overviews and provides a bit of a theoretical context for why this is so. And she's still working at the moment on um, how you can use this in language teaching. And if you fancy it, have a look at the pattern grammar um, webpage because Susan has done fantastic videos explaining it all. 
and um, yeah, without making this too long, but then how history or the development has gone, we've now got people like Florent Perec or Amanda Patton who work together with Susan on Patton Grammar, thinking about links between this and construction grammar. Or then we have got people like Udo Winter who uses corpora, but is also very much into cognitive mm. linguistics, thinking about this, or then we're looking at how you can construct experiments to test to test effects of language. So I've done some work with Matteo Fuoli on, uh, you know, looking at tweets and how people respond to tweets with the help of tests. So I think corpus linguistics is quite nice in that it can develop. And I think at Birmingham, we see quite a bit of this in terms of broadening out and going into other directions. But hopefully you will have more of us and then they can all tell you what they're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be wonderful. And yes. on top of all of that, uh, the area of, of your own research that we're discussing today, of course, is in literary linguistics, mm -hmm. applying uh, mm -hmm. corpus linguistic methods to the study of fiction. Um, this is also known as stylistics, and, and maybe there's a, a, a distinction there. Yeah. I, some people sort of see them as uh, synonymous, but mm -hmm. we, maybe we won't get stuck in the weeds of, of that sort of thing. <laughs> no. Stylistics, literary yeah. linguistics, whatever you want yeah. to call it. Yeah. Um, how is the study of, of literature enhanced mm. by linguistic theory? Robbie, that is a very leading question. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, is know? it enhanced? Yeah, exactly. There's some directionality. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> bias in language all the time. So, yeah. no, it, um, but it's interesting how you ask that question uh -huh. because that immediately assumes that the study of literature and the study of language are different things. Mm. You know, and that is something that I personally feel is just the result of how people thought they needed to structure English departments. Yeah. You know, it's got you've got the linguists down that side of the corridor and then your literary folks somewhere there. But actually, to me, this belongs together. And mm. I think um, Jeff Leach and Mick Short explained this brilliantly in their style and fiction book, you know, where they look at Spitz's philological uh, circle, where they say, you know, you can look at a text as a work of art and then see what kind of impression does this leave on you? How do mm. you respond to it as some kind of artistic product? Or you can look at it as a sample of the language and then you can say, how many nouns do I have? Mm. What do the adjectives do? And both of that is okay. And you can go in a circle and say, I first look at this, try to find an explanation. And I think that is um, where it should come together. And so, Basically, what I've said in response to your question now is that you can't ask the question like this, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, point taken. <laughs> yeah. um, but when we, I suppose, from from the the linguistic and specifically the corpus linguistic perspective, we, we do often sort of frame it as mm. we are we are applying corpus yes. methods to mm -hmm. something. Yeah, and and so you know you you've published on. Uh, corpus stylistics, this, mm. this combination. Yeah. Um, do you think that corpus linguistics has become more routinely accepted uh, as an approach to the study of fiction w with what you say in, in yeah. mind in terms of this kind of uh, history of, of separation? Yeah. You know, is, yeah. is it more kind of accepted now? I, as I think it is, you know, because I, I was really quite pleased. We had, is it a week, two weeks ago, we had the British Association for Victorian Studies conference at mm. the University of Birmingham. I've been going to these conferences and I've been a member of Baths now for yeah, quite a few years. And what I find quite amazing is how now more recently, you, you bump into more and more people who say, oh, you know, I've, I've tried this out and I've run a little concordance here yeah. and I've actually come across this tool. And, and I think that is really quite, quite a good thing. Uh, so so um, every time I'm very happy to see someone who does this. And, uh, and so I think, yeah, it, it has a huge effect. It is massively helpful in a way. I think what is more difficult probably is the position between um, corpus stylistics and then digital humanities. And mm. you had an episode on uh, digital humanities as well. And I think that is probably where we have a lot more work to do so that people actually talk better with each other and see 
that we're not living in parallel universes, but actually do a lot of the same stuff, only use different terms to talk about it. So. And we'll talk about it a little bit later about sort of the practicalities of ways that we can access uh, mm. fictional text with these yeah. methods. But I want to ask you first, because you know, you look at your list of publications and there's a certain author's name that appears over and over and over again, Charles Dickens. Yeah, yeah. What is it with Charles Dickens? You know, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what is it about uh, his, his body of work that you mm. are so drawn to? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I've got some, a very good friend who, who always asks about the other man in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my husband is already used to this. So, but uh, Dickens is, is, is kind of, it, it's also somehow it always starts with um, what you encountered at university, I feel. So I, I did, at the University of Exeter, I did a fantastic module on Charles Dickens. Mm. And, uh, you know, we had this lecturer, Chris Brooks, and he was absolutely wonderful. And he made us read a novel every week. You know, read a Dickens novel every week. You know, that that is quite... Wow. Uh, and so so I really had this intense exposure <laughs> <laughs> to a lot of... And, and then when you do corpse linguistics at the same time, you see things like repetitions a lot more. And Dickens is also someone who is really famous for repetition. And I think, you know, I haven't brought much in terms of examples mm -hmm. or so, but there's one that I really just want to read out to you because in David Copperfield, he says something that almost sounds like he is speaking as a corpus linguist because Dickens was very aware of what you can do with language and understood how repetition works. And somewhere he says um, in David Copperfield, conventional phrases are a sort of fireworks, easily let off and liable to take a great variety of shapes and colors, not at all suggested by their original form. And, mm. you know, to me, this was something where you think, yes, he totally got it. Like yeah. it is about how things are set repeatedly recycled in different contexts and then have an effect that might be quite different from what was there initially. And so there's so much in Dickens where I thought we need to have a closer look. I mean, A, he understands how mm. language works. He's produced an awful lot, which is, you will know this, when you create a corpus, it is better you have a lot of data. <laughs> and Dickens was just fabulous for this. And this is kind of how I thought I need to look into this more. And, and that quote there, you know, almost sounds like it could have been written by somebody many, many years later talking about semantic prosody, for example. Yeah. You're right, he, yeah. he got it. Yeah. Are, are there any sort of particular examples of, of patterns, maybe in a particular novel where you mm. sort, of, sort of saw that and went, oh, okay, this, mm. is, this is very interesting and it proves why corpus mm. approaches can be so useful for studying this sort of text? Mm. Yeah, no, I think what, what Dickens is really the master of is using things in language that are used by a lot of other people as well, but then putting them together mm. in such a way. So, and this is why I got so into body language because body language is where you can see this really very, very convincingly because um, what you get in Dickens or when literary critics look at Dickens, they always focus on these strange or odd characters, you know, that behave in some kind of odd way, stand on one leg, put their head to one side, do something that looks rather weird if you think about mm -hmm. how would that look in the real world. But these examples are so good because Dickens does the range. So he also describes body language that has, that was very common at the time, that is described in other authors as well and then he has this cline of using very common patterns and putting them together in very exceptional ways and that really then gives a fantastic effect so uh, so he has a lot of these um you, you know where you've got ing forms like he said nodding his head mm -hmm. you know or he said putting his hand in his pockets or you know and these are common across 19th century fiction so it's not particularly the Dickensian. But the funny thing is, when you only have one little extract and see one example, you think, wow, Dickens is brilliant. Look at how he used this ING form. But then if you compare it to a lot of other texts, you see, this is a typical way of using the ING form in um, you know, 19th century fiction. 
but Dickens just puts it together now with some other things, and that is the effect. And yeah. So let's talk about how you and your team access these sorts of mm. patterns, and also help others mm. access these these patterns. You, uh, for a few years now, have, have led on the development of a, of a web app called Click. Mm -hmm. um, Click Fiction. I think it was originally called Click Dickens, yeah. and then suddenly things other than Dickens appeared, and yeah. it sort of broadened out over time. Yeah. Um, this is a, a freely available mm. online tool. Mm. What does it offer, and, and who is it for? Yeah, OK. So uh, we started off, and, and I think that is important, that originally um, the ideas were ideas that were developed that, together with Peter Stockwell. You know? so, so Peter, for quite a long time, was saying things about corpus linguistics <laughs> that uh, I wasn't quite agreeing with. And I think um, he, he likes to be pro provocative in that way. And then we, we at some point thought, you know, we really need to talk a little bit more to each other. And now Peter does corpus linguistics and can <laughs> handle click and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And I'm also getting more to that understanding where for him it, it was a point of contention. So. Click has really been designed with thinking about not just corpus linguists, but also literary scholars. So what is the stuff that they would be interested in? How would they wish to look at the text? Do we need to present the text in a different format mm -hmm. if we try to read it really as a novel? So one of the things that was crucial for Click is that the texts that are in Click, they're all annotated for this distinction between fictional speech and non-fictional uh, speech. Mm -hmm. So we put, um, so we marked up everything that is within quotation marks and we called this quotes, short, and then everything that is outside of quotation marks is just non-quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that uh, in, in Victorian fiction, that works really rather well. I mean, it, it wouldn't necessarily in contemporary fiction, but there it's very often then direct speech rather than direct thought or writing presentation. And then you can search concordances in the fictional speech sections. And we've also then marked up things in between fictional speech and um, another bit of fictional speech where the narrator comes in and interrupts. So you have something like a character sentence and blah, 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 blah. And then the narrator comes in and says, said Mr. Pickwick, nodding his head and then Mr. Pickwick continues mm. talking and these are places that you know if you do a normal corpus normal <laughs> if you do a corpus analysis generally that's not something people would be necessarily interested in if you study fiction however it is really interesting because then you have these different levels of fictional characters in the speech situation the narrator coming in commenting on this situation so you have different ways of searching your concordances and that was important to us. I think that's a really interesting point you've made there and in the interest of balance yeah I think this is an example of ideas from literary study yeah being applied that were potentially being applied the other way around because mm. the work that you've done in looking at I think you call them suspensions mm -hmm. the, these little bits in between where you yeah. get a reporting verb yes and you you might have said as being the, the neutral mm. if, if there is such a thing yeah. but of course that could be yelled cried mm -hmm. etc yeah. this sort of thing is applied now routinely in you know studies of news discourse mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. elements of evaluation can be yes. brought in by yeah. how speech is being reported. So, so how do you see that? I guess this is sort of leading to a broader question of mm. the the mm. the applicability of literary thinking to, dare I say, real world issues. But it's yeah. quite topical, you yeah. know, yeah. talking about the value of of literary study. So, mm. how how do you sort of see that that relationship kind of looking the other way, coming from? from literature and, and literary mm. thinking being applied to, to language. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe on that uh, suspended quotation, just quickly, that came from a book from Mark Lumbert. He put, published that book in the 1980s or so on Dickens and the suspended quotation. And he just did all this by hand, like mm. pulling them out, counting them. You know, this is where it comes from. But on this link between yeah, the, the fiction and the real world, this, this is ultimately we use the same language, you know, whether you create fictional worlds and um, talk about, you know, 
what happens in Little Dorrit or so, or whether you talk about the real world, it is the same language. So to me, again, you, you realize I don't like uh, dichotomies. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like these neat boxes mm. where you say, this is literature, mm. this is language, this is fiction, this is real. It doesn't work like this. You know, the world is much more, it's all about continua. You know, it's everything is happening on a client, gradual changes. And we use the same language to talk about fictional stuff and about the real world. And it's also, you know, we think we know facts, but facts are very often just the stories that are most readily accepted. You know, even if you look at uh, stuff in, in, in science, you know, storytelling matters an awful lot there as, as well in the terms of how do you describe inventions, who was involved in finding something, how, how do you position this, or if you look at History. History is also about, you know, the stories, the narratives, and how how you tell things, and that then connects very much to literary history, because again, Dickens is a super example for this. If, if you read one Dickens novel, you know, if you just read Little Dorrit, and that is all that you read, then you think, oh yeah, that is um, Dickens's fictional representation of something. If you read all of Dickens's novels, you see there there are things that happen again, appear again. If you read a lot of Victorian fiction, you get not just literary history, but you also get cultural history. You get this overlap between fiction and reality because the way people are described in fiction relates to how people saw the world. You mm. know, and I think this is really, really important. And that is also something we today shouldn't forget when we think about news reporting for instance, this is, you know, then in news, you would talk about framing mm. or so, but that is also making a selection and seeing the world in a particular way. So again, it's, it's all a client. <laughs> so in, in the context of what we've seen in recent months and, and years, I suppose this ideological attack on, mm. on English departments at oh, university, yeah. we, we've started. seen, <laughs> we've seen, you know, even th this year, um, some really, you know, yeah. sad cases where where unfortunately departments have, have closed and and there's this sense of you know value and 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 a lot of ideological perspectives about employability and yeah. contributing to real world problems i suppose what what you're saying is that this is one of the major contributions mm -hmm. understanding ourselves our place in the world yeah. through the ways in which people write about it Yes, exactly. It is, you know, going back to the beginning, language is a social phenomenon. Mm. To me, language is about making sense of the world through the way you talk about it. And you need fiction for this, because fiction is a place where you can think alternative realities, where you can think about different class systems, if you wish, where you can think about different political systems. If you look at, uh, you know, I had a conversation with Peter Stockwell about science fiction. If you look at certain type of in inventions, you know, how things start off in science fiction and then mm -hmm. what happens later on in the world isn't so different. You know, you need this safe space where you can just think every thought you want to think and that can then lead to creativity in the real world and this political yeah i know the mickey mouse rhetoric mm -hmm. is back isn't it yeah oh, you know when i have another cab driver asking oh you work in ah oh, so there's one of these mickey mouse subjects <laughs> you know taking me to examine yeah. uh, a phd somewhere <laughs> but this is okay so um but uh, this is really it makes life or it makes the world a lot more simple if you can say literature language doesn't matter because mm. then you can have your little categories and your boxes and you can say this is good this is bad this is the right party this but as soon as you open them and allow the language then you have to be critical mm. then you have to question and this is why for political ideology it's not good if you mm. question a system that's not good for the system so it's better to close down the english degree because then people start thinking you know independent thought who wants that so i think we now need literature language arts and humanities degrees probably more than ever because it's so dangerous if you just go along with what people say the world is like you need to question and literature is also about yeah it's about 
perspective taking, isn't it? If you look at the trouble that we have in this country at the moment in terms of othering and looking at people, you know, this whole us mm. and them, and you can have so many categories in which that happens. This is a lack of ability to take other people's perspective because you just have your terms, your way of thinking. And literature is a prime example of where you get drawn in, experience stuff in a way that a character does see the world from a different perspective. If you close that down, yes, it is simple, but it's also dangerous, very mm. dangerous. And one of the ways of, of encouraging people to take you know, uh, an arts or a humanities subject like English more seriously is to, to make it more accessible, the, the sort of the practical applications. And, and, and I want to go back to, to Click because, mm. uh, you know, this is a tool that is very useful for researchers, but also, you know, I've, I've, I've used it myself, I've, I've taught with it myself, and it's very okay. user friendly. Mm. And so is, a, is there another target audience of getting it into schools, you know, A-level students, mm. GCSE mm. English students, mm. you know, they can pick their favorite Dickens novel, mine, probably, you know, a bit basic, but Oliver Twist. It's um, a very good one, <laughs> absolutely. Actually, I, I was in a production of Oliver Twist, the musical, ah, when, I was, when I was younger, so I've got a, a special connection with that. I'm not going to break out in a song, don't worry. Um, but are you, you know, it, is it something that you're, you're encouraging schools to, to use and just sort of play and explore yes. and, and see yes. what they make of it? Absolutely. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of work with uh, fantastic schools. And, it, you know, what makes me personally very, very happy is when you then have teachers who kind of find it themselves and do activities with it themselves. And then you just stumble across these activities because sometimes they share them on Twitter. And you, oh, there's someone. <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah, you know, because yeah. you then see how people really, um, you know, do something with it that is helpful for them in that particular context. You know, mm. things that activities that we've done a lot with with teacher training um, uh, groups or also in schools with actual pupils is a Christmas Carol is one that is absolutely wonderful mm. to explore with Click because there you have such a nice text structure mm. in terms of how Scrooge uh, changes from the beginning to the end, and that is something that with uh, distribution plots and then concordance analysis, you can really very, very nicely do. And so there are a lot of things uh, that you can do in this way. And we also have one corpus that is the direct result of the engagement with, uh, you know, people who, who teach. Uh, we call this um, arts corpus, additionally requested oh. text. So that was kind <laughs> of like we thought we have all these things nice. in click. And then teachers came to us and said, this is all good and well, but what we really want is this, this, and that. And then we created this corpus in response to, you know, texts that are then more GCSE or A-level texts. And so, yeah, no, I think there's a lot that can be done with this. And um, another angle to it is also, and that brings us back to the Mickey Mouse rhetoric. You know, when when these arguments are wheeled out to say, yeah, oh, it's all STEM and everything mm. has to be data science and computer science and all the rest of it. If you look at things like click, these are also examples to say how it all belongs together, mm. you know, you, you, and we had a couple of really nice experiences where we then had um, in school children who weren't so interested necessarily in the literature, but actually they liked playing at the computer. And, mm. uh, you know, so it was the same with my son. He, when he first looked at things, he said, like, mommy, how do you play this game? <laughs> 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 yeah, so so it, it's a bit how you can bring things together as well. So what's the the, the future development of Click looking mm. like? You mentioned that people are now requesting mm. texts. Mm. Um, are there restrictions? I, I, I guess this is sort of a broader corpusy question. You know, yeah. obviously there are there are copyright issues mm. and older texts from centuries ago. Mm. You know, I don't know what the but clearly you can just take them after a certain mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a way of, of allowing people to use a tool like Click uh, to explore contemporary text, or mm. are there mm. are there restrictions on you can't just go and buy a book and chuck it no, on there no, and no, you no. know <laughs> no so everything that is in Click is is okay in terms of copyright so 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 that is that but 
what we've been trying to do with Click quite intensively is to make sure, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also quite into open research. So what we've done with Click is everything we have created is um, all on GitHub. So everyone can use it, can take it, can develop it further mm. if they like. We've really gone all out with documentation to explain what you can do or how things are defined. Also, we've now made our um, click tagger available as a standalone tool. So if you have texts, you can just, um, you know, annotate them for speech and non-speech oh. yourself, you know, so you don't need us to do this for you. And that gets around some of these issues, obviously, but it isn't, uh, so we can't upload stuff that isn't. Yeah, um, but uh, with, with the tagger, that's that's quite, nice because potentially that means somebody kind of privately if you will with the, mm -hmm. with with the text that they have yeah. can do their own in-house work and, exactly. and they're not sharing the data you exactly. know they're, they're not re redistributing exactly. it and I, I i guess and we'll, we'll move on to um something else in a moment but i suppose one of the the great things about being able to distinguish the speech from the non-speech or the, the narration, mm. is you can also then distinguish different characters and look at their style. You could right? do that as well, yeah. I mean, we haven't, that, that is something that is definitely something for the future mm. because you can't do everything at the yeah. same time. You know, if you then have the character recognition on top of it, that yeah. is then really interesting as well. Yes, absolutely. So that would be a nice like next step. And we've got a whole wish list of things that mm. we would like to do. But you know, again, what it's like, you know, you then need some kind of, next grant that yeah. enables you to do this so it depends on what will come off next <laughs> where <laughs> where the direction will go well we'll is. keep an eye out so yeah, do, do. very exciting um okay i want to ask you about something completely different although there's a sort of tangential link which is uh you know making uh thoughts about language accessible to mm. the public you have your own podcast yeah. right <laughs> life and language yeah. um and recently you had quite a well-known actor on it as well which was uh, mm. a wonderful surprise mm. tell me a bit more about that about setting a podcast what was the idea behind it and uh what's the kind of the the aim of the discussions that you've mm. been having yeah so yeah it's kind of you know the strap line is a podcast about life mm. and how language matters so this really started off from the idea, to say, again, it all goes back to language as a social phenomenon. Yeah. You know, I was looking at, um, yeah, language is everywhere. People use it all the time. Everyone has got something to say about language. There are all sorts of advice books on how to and uh, courses on how to use language. But not necessarily all the time um, would people uh, not necessarily would people make connections to linguistics you know and, and mm. that is something that i thought that there must be a way of getting in there and i thought if i so i had various ideas for how i could do this podcast and then in the end i thought i want to make it really not explicitly linguistic as an explainer podcast. You know, you could have done this as well to say today I take this topic mm. and then I explain this thing. But I really didn't want to do this because I think, and this is getting broader, but mm. this is also important for corpus linguistics. We need to learn how to listen better so that we can understand what are people interested in when they're dealing with language because there are then all the projects that we as corpus linguists could do. So I thought, I try and do a podcast where I talk to people about what they do and ask questions in such a way that I can get insights about how they think about language. They don't necessarily all see these conversations in that way. And, mm. you know, one that was really, really interesting was, um, you know, the response after the podcast was when Alice Roberts said to me, look, this was, you know, the way you asked these questions and you made me think about my own writing in a completely different, I've never looked at it like mm. this before. And I thought, to me, that that is the interesting bit. So to try and work out how does language matter to people without saying I'm doing in a linguistic analysis of your language and mm. I'm using this in a study? Obviously, full disclosure, you, as you can imagine, <laughs> there's something working in the background behind this. So uh, watch this space. But mm -hmm. I'm not uh, 
yeah, sharing explicitly yet how, how will that will turn out. Anyway, to me, it's really the, the fun of listening and working out what people do with language. And then now the way it has developed is I then get little thematic strands. So I've done a sequence of, you know, looking at poetry, science fiction, fantasy fiction, historical fiction, to kind of look at different ways how you deal with the world in this language context. And um, there will be another little sequence coming up where I look at business stories mm. and see how that all connects. But it's really the idea behind it is trying to get at why is language so important and asking these questions to then understand more than telling people and then yeah watch this space for where this will lead <laughs> oh, i look forward to that so it, it pretty much everything you you do your research your sharing the the click app your podcasts everything else you're thoroughly and utterly convincing people that language matters um and that it's relevant to to everything things that you know traditionally are valued perhaps more than so-called Mickey Mouse degrees. You've certainly convinced me. Um, not that I needed it, of course. No, that's <laughs> preaching, preaching to the to choir. The choir yeah. isn't it? <laughs> um, this has been really interesting. We, I'm gonna we're gonna start to to wrap up now, um, and I'm gonna ask you three quick questions uh, oh. that I ask uh, all my guests. Let's see what I can <laughs> quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll see how we go. Um, so these are, we're zooming out from, from literary linguistics and, and just talking more broadly about corpus linguistics now. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's the, the biggest change that you've noticed in corpus research uh, mm. since the beginning of your career? Mm. Hmm. Probably uh, um, the way people used methods. So mm. I think at the beginning, reading concordances was a really big thing. And you you know, when I started going to conferences, you would always see slides or then OHPs you know, at this <laughs> point where people had concordances on and they showed what was happening and then kind of moved away from this became a lot more quantitative a mm. lot more statistical and you know people got more into different tools and all the rest of it so I think that that was quite a change and I'm hoping that I'm seeing a little bit of a rethinking this and maybe going back to the reading concordance that is certainly something I'm very keen on seeing again so we're, we're repositioning the text at yeah. the core of, yeah. of what we and do that's again that's the language and literature for me it's always yeah. been that it's never gone away yeah. but i think um overall in our field maybe a little bit and um, i'm looking forward to welcoming people to the text again <laughs> <laughs> brilliant um question two yeah what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered oh that's a difficult question but I think, I, yeah, no, I think if you could call this a misconception, you hear people often say, or broad brush writing, mm. corpus linguistics adds or objectivity to what you do. And it makes it all systematic mm. and objective. That is a misconception because it's no more objective than anything else is objective, you, you know? <laughs> uh, but you just place the decision-making at the different point, mm. you know? You, it's in the corpus compilation, it's in the choice of the tool, but you still need subjectivity, otherwise it doesn't work. So I think that for me is the greatest when people then say, now I'm doing a corpus study, this is totally objective, and now mm. I tell you all about how the language works. And finally, yeah. What's the future for corpus linguistics? How will it make an impact on the world in the future? Hmm. Going back to the beginning, to the language as a social phenomenon, also the stuff that I'm trying to do with the podcast, hmm. I would hope that we can get to a point where it can really make an impact on really every area. Language is everywhere. And if we as corpus linguists find a way of explaining what we do and it's good job that you are doing this so it's really good to see taking this out and um, explaining mm. in, in that kind of uh, regard so i think the impact can really happen in every area but 
there's a slight challenge to this. And the, this is always with the, you know, calling it corpse linguistics, I don't think is a very mm. happy choice. You know, I'm, I'm actually getting to the stage where I'm almost advocating to drop the corpus. It's kind of, it's the linguistics of the 21st century, isn't it? In a world that is all digital, where you have to deal with data and where you have to make sense of language and data doing proper linguistics will have to use corpus methods. And, you know, this is also, you know, where for me the, the life and language, you know, you, you see how, where the agenda is behind mm. it all. But I think, yeah, that I, is where our potential lies. I think you've prompted me to introduce a new uh, question for oh. future episodes, <laughs> which is, do we need to call it corpus mm. linguistics anymore? Yeah. Um, I feel like we're maybe going off on a bit of a rant, not a rant, but I, you know, I've, I'm early in my career. I've been doing this for a few years. Um, and I've noticed that we seem to be obsessed with making sure that everybody knows that it's a corpus based study. I'm, I, I don't say I'm guilty of it. It's, I'm, I don't know whether, I don't know whether I negatively evaluate mm -hmm. it or not, but it's something I've noticed that I don't really see with other methods, mm -hmm. but you know what the corpus are because it's in the title of the paper, yes. you know, topic, colon, a corpus-based mm. analysis of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. We seem to be stuck in a, a, a loop of telling people what corpus yeah. linguistics is, as if they have never heard of it yeah. before. I wonder when, when do we stop? Mm. <laughs> when, and this is part, you know, this whole thing is part of that sort of introducing, but when is it that we kind of go, okay, we can mm. assume that it's, it's established enough. We don't mm. need to start from scratch and say, corpus linguistics is blah, 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 blah. Yeah. The method is not so important as the, mm. the substance of the research. I don't know if you you yeah. sort of have thoughts oh, about yeah, that. No. Oh, wonderful God, that's a <laughs> wonderful question, because I think I'm doing a Dickens here now in terms mm. of repeating uh, mm. for another time. That, that is what I meant at the beginning with, you know, for me, corpus linguistics starts with the way we see language. The methods are secondary. Mm. You know, there was a period in corpus linguistics where people always said corpus linguistics is a method. Mm. I've always said you need corpus theoretical stuff. I, I've written a book that mm -hmm. has got that in the title. And maybe at the time people weren't so keen on it. And I'm hoping maybe now that people are getting to this. Maybe some people will look at this again and think, you know what, actually, because if you start with how you look at the language, if you think about, you know, the, the patterns, the generalizability, the social norms, if you start with this, there is no need to constantly emphasize mm. that you use computers. And especially <laughs> now that the world is all digital, there is no need to do this. I think what we really need is more linguistics in data science, more linguistics in AI. We don't need more AI methods in corpus linguistics. We need to remind ourselves that we are experts in language. And that is the strength, and this is where we can have this impact and really do something. There we go. There's our call to action. <laughs> and with that, we will wrap things up before we go, go on a, a million rants about all sorts of things. Um, so thank you uh, to our listeners and viewers of Corpus Cast. Um, thank you for joining us, however you've accessed us, whether that's on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, or Podchaser. Uh, please do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes using the hashtag CorpusCast and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. And you can even email us now at corpus at aston.ac.uk. Um, I'm the only one reading that inbox at the moment, but uh, we'll hopefully over time more people will. Um, Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thank you again for listening and watching. And thank you, Michaela Malberg, University of Birmingham, for being such a wonderful guest. It's been really good to speak to you today. Thank you, Robbie, for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.